you so much. Uh, we will go a bit into neurology and uh, the first thing is stroke. Uh, stroke management has also changed over the years and now uh, we can do much better than we used to do. And the role of family physician in stroke has also become significant. Uh, so uh, first of all, just a bit, if a patient comes to you with hemiplegia, for example, and uh, the patient has come within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, that hemiplegia may recover because it was a TIA. Initially, we used to think that a TIA means 24 hours recovery is possible. Now, we uh, think that TIA should be defined by less than a few minutes of recovery. So, if the patient has come with one hour of paresis, this is a patient who might benefit with, uh, with thrombolysis. Uh, so, the window, what is the window for thrombolysis now, intravenous thrombolysis? Um. So they keep changing, you know, it used to be three hours and it became six hours. Now I think they're even talking of 24 hours and things like that. But intra-arterial uh, thrombolysis is three hours and sometimes extendable to six. Okay. Uh, the commoner uh, thrombolysis with, what, with a thrombolytic agent called tenactive plays uh, is the window given is 4.5 hours for intravenous thrombolysis. And within that 4.5 hours, what you need to do is diagnose that this is an ischemic stroke and not a hemorrhagic stroke because you can't give thrombolysis in hemorrhagic stroke. So what is the modality that they should send a patient immediately for an MR or a CT? Because we know that hemorrhage can be detected on CT also. What should so they send it can for? I, can I move yeah. one step back here? So I think, you know, when... when um, Tushar said, patient comes to you with hemiplegia. If given the traffic situation and all the other issues in Mumbai, I think first you may get a phone call saying that a person is hemiplegic. And I think it starts from there. If you are quite convinced that the patient has a stroke on the phone itself, I think the only option is to go to a hospital that manages stroke. There is, so that would mean Nanavati Max here, Kokila Ben, Reliance HN in South Bombay, and each Hinduja, you know, I think each three or four months, a new hospital is able to establish a 24 seven uh, stroke unit. It, First one was uh, Kokila Ben and then now every more and more hospitals have it. Because if you are going to either go to their house or wait for them to come to you, then maybe get a CT scan done at a scan center, wait to talk to the radiologist, see the report, then decide if the patient is a candidate for stroke, you've pretty much lost the window. So I think the most important thing is that clinically if you think the patient has a stroke, even at the risk of over-investigations, the patient needs to get uh, to a stroke unit where then they will decide what they want to do. It will start with a plain CT or a perfusion CT, uh, CTA. And then based on that, they will decide uh, whether or not thrombolysis is required, whether it's intravenous or intra-arterial, whether, you know, all of that decision-making will then happen. But I think more than anything else, the most important thing is for the patient to reach a hospital that has a 24-7 stroke unit. That is the only critical point in all of this. So as you said, a very important thing for us is to do a video call and find out that this is a stroke. Because if that is done, then the patient need not struggle. Of course, we will sometimes get the patient directly coming to our clinic, not realizing that they had to call you. But otherwise, uh, a video call is mandatory. And I do believe that though we, a lot of our family physicians, consultants, uh, they kind of, you know, 
से कि मैं इतने बजे के बाद मोबाइल फोन ऑन नहीं रखूंगा मैं ये कहूंगा एंड वी ऑल हैव आर ओन ओपिनियंस ऑन हाउ मच प्राइवेसी वी नीड एंड हाउ मच आई डू बिलीव दैट माइक्रो इन्फॉक्शन एंड स्ट्रोक्स आर ऑफन टेलीफोनिकली डायग्नोज इजीली एंड इफ यू कैन अफोर्ड टू कीप योर मोबाइल फोन ऑन इवन एट ऑड आवर्स माइन इज ऑन ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स एंड आई नेवर I try not to miss calls, or at least the calls are diverted to my assistants. So uh, I would say that these two emergencies are such that you can actually save a patient's life. Uh, so the, what he said is, usually there's a corridor in say Nanavati Hospital. If the patient of a stroke goes to the casualty, they, from there the patient goes straight to the CT or MR center, gets a scan done, and uh, uh, then the procedure uh, goes forward. what is better again in a stroke acute stroke we used to believe that ct takes less time mr takes more time has that changed no i think it, you still start with ct and ct perfusion and then decide on mr based on the ct criteria okay. i do know a couple of places do an mr directly as well but it's individualized from our perspective ct first is good yeah. so uh, if the ct shows no hemorrhage but does not show a infarct which can be possible right within hmm. in how many hours does a ct normally show an infarct usually within an hour you should be able Even to see CT. subtle signs yeah but then <clears throat> these days they use something called a ct perfusion which then goes through an ai tool called rapid and then a lot of decision making just happens on that wow okay so rapid became one of the first fda approved ai tools for acute stroke to such an extent now that the radiologists have been completely bypassed so the patient comes with a stroke gets a ct perfusion done all the images go through rapid directly to the neuro interventional person wow. which could, could be a neurologist or a radiologist but the diagnostic radiologist doesn't come into the picture at all and then based on that data they take a decision of doing nothing versus intravenous versus intra arterial and it's all done that's why it's called rapid it's really really rapid it's instantaneous stuff now rapid makes mistakes but then the person looking at the images also has the patient in front of them to be able to take those decisions rapid is available in india and i believe it's being used by most hospitals now as well it's so a ct sequence is there rapid in mr also no i am not aware okay, but so it's a ct neuro imaging is not um uh, something i do on a daily basis i'm aware of the concepts but i don't look at uh, ct and brain mris uh, regularly so so uh, stroke of course is something that we have to also know a interventional neurologist all of us should know their interventional neurologists and who should be therefore uh, contactable immediately because as soon as a patient of stroke comes to you or you diagnose stroke the first thing you will probably do is call the interventional neurologist and ask him where should i send the patient if the patient if the neurologist goes to multiple institutions and send the patient to that place as soon as possible actually uh, i i beg to differ a little here because the whole purpose of having a 24/7 stroke unit is that it is doctor agnostic which means that the hospital it should not matter who the doctor is uh, at that point in time because the whole purpose of a 24/7 unit is that there will be a qualified individual available at instantaneous notice ideally they'll work in shifts and be present there or in some instances they actually live within a 1 or 2 km radius and they are on call they will be there in 10 minutes or half an hour or something like that so whether you know an interventional neurologist neuroradiologist etc should not matter that practically of course it makes life easier you talk to them etc but it should not matter stroke stroke hospital with 24/7 unit and it is the hospital's responsibility if they are advertising a 24/7 stroke unit to have the people 
take care of the stroke. And I, I know this earlier was a challenge, like when Kokila Ben advertised its stroke unit, I have a friend who lives in Khar whose mom had an acute stroke at 6 p.m. on a Sunday. <laughs> the worst time you can have a stroke, right? And the lead neurologist there had gone for a lecture somewhere else. And the um, second in command, the uh, consultant, but a very junior consultant was on wedding leave. And despite having advertised a 24-7 stroke unit, there was no neurologist available till next morning, which today will never happen in the five or six hospitals that advertise 24-7 stroke units. They will have a qualified neurologist or a neuroradiologist available 24-7. That is the only way they can call themselves a stroke unit. So their only job really is to know the names of those hospitals and to confirm in advance with, you know, over a period of time, you would know whether they are truly uh, functioning as 24-7 stroke, stroke unit. units or not. So I think, like, we went through the list. Kokila Ben, Nanavati, Reliance HN, Hinduja, Wokhard, Agripada. Um, that's it, actually, isn't it? Global. Global. Global has an acute stroke. So, like I said, and each one is trying to develop one in the locality. So today, at least if you are in the Bombay city limits, chances are you will find somebody within, you know, two or three kilometers uh, to get to. But I was actually telling Tushar the story when we met, you know, in my building, one of my neighbors who I had grown up with got a stroke. His daughter's a dentist. In half an hour, the patient was taken to a hospital, but they just landed up at the wrong hospital where they did not have a stroke unit, but there was a neurologist. The neurologist saw them and did not advise thrombolysis despite the CT having been done all within a three-hour window. So sometimes it's all matka, no? I mean, it, it was just everything went perfect. The only mistake the dentist's daughter made is she did not check whether the hospital they were going to was a stroke, 24-7 stroke unit or not. And that's messed up everything. Yeah. So you just, as, as physicians, I think this is our value. You know, you know where to go and you can guide them instantaneously. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, one thing that we should remember to do is if you diagnose a stroke, uh, like in MI we give aspirin, don't give aspirin because if you're going to thrombolize the patient, maybe the risk of bleeding will increase. So avoid aspirin, send the patient straight to the stroke uh, unit. Okay. Uh, a few questions. Uh, they are neuro neuroimaging, uh, but if you can guide us. Uh, what is the protocol of doing an imaging for a first seizure? An adult. So I'm, I'm begging off the, the question. Okay. Yeah. Fair Se enough. Seizures, I mean, I can talk about tumors to some extent, but seizures is so focused. My neuroradiologists have been doing this for 20 years. I, I don't get into it <laughs> Fair at enough. all. So. Uh, for, uh, I, I don't know how, what your opinion is generally, but if a patient comes with first seizure, an adult, which is an unprovoked seizure, what we call unprovoked is there is no precipitating uh, fever or infection, meningitis, or a drug that causes seizures like mefloquine, for example. If it is an unprovoked seizure, first seizure, an imaging is mandatory and an MRI is preferred over, uh, over a CT scan. And what my MRI, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Patkar or Dr. Roshan Shetty advises is, whenever you are writing, if you can give a brief history, that's very good, or you give a protocol. So MRI seizure protocol will be a good protocol to give. For example, there is a condition that we discussed on the PPT called mesial temporal sclerosis. And if, if you are giving the seizure protocol, they will look for mesial temporal sclerosis. And if you give a dementia protocol, they will look for hippocampal atrophy, etc. So give the protocol, headache protocol, they will do a venography to detect uh, sagittal sinus or any venous sinus thrombosis. So, uh, 
a brief history or the name of a protocol. Even Vertigo, there is a protocol where they will look at the CP angle and look for CP angle tumors. And uh, yeah. trigeminal neuralgia, they will have a different kind of sequence that they will do called the cyst sequence. So you must either give a detailed history or give the name of a broad protocol which will cover the things that you want to. Uh, yeah. I, I was just talking to uh, one, of the one of you outside and I think this is the issue that now happens. A lot of the scan centers don't have in-house radiologists at the time the scans are being done. A lot of them are these chains like Krishna, Aarti or even uh, second locations of, uh, you know, good setups. But, you know, it's at the periphery and they try to run it uh, in, in a hub and spoke manner. So when you don't have a radiologist to check every prescription, then the only person who can take a decision is the technologist. And the technicians at the end of the day are not doctors. So if, the, if you know, what is written is what they will do. So if you write epilepsy protocol, they will know what an epilepsy protocol is. But if you just write MRI brain, they are not the ones necessarily taking a history as well. They may just do whatever they feel like at that point in time and nobody has a leg to stand on because if you complain, they'll say, but you didn't write down. Um, and if somebody else complains, then, you know, everybody can just, or, you know, have a blame game, but it's just an unfortunate thing. And I'll tell you sometimes the consequences of this, right? Um, uh, and I'm digressing from no, neuro no. a little. We have an interstitial lung disease protocol. It's a very simple protocol where you do inspiratory, expiratory and supine and prone imaging. It's required the first time that the patient is ever sent for an ILD scanning screen, whatever. There are some centers, even when the radiologist is there, will take some shortcuts and either not do the prone or not do the expiratory or something like that. Now let's say the patient spends four, five thousand rupees on a CT scan. Then the pulmonologist is unhappy with the scan and the report, so sends the scan to me for a second opinion. My second opinion charge is four and a half thousand, and you know just upfront. So I give a report, then I say the scan is suboptimal and needs to be repeated either now or sometimes I'll say after two, three months or something like that. But you need a good baseline. How do you? compare in the future, talk of progression, regression, patterns, unless you have a good first scan. So then very often the patient within a month is sent for a repeat scan to me, which will be another six and a half thousand. So one scan, which for four, five thousand could have been done properly. See, interpretation is one thing. Okay, uh, since we were talking about stroke units across the city and multiple, which BMC hospitals have a stroke unit, if you would know? None? I think yeah, tell me, Shaula. KEM probably, if at all. I, I know Cyan doesn't have, Nair doesn't have. None of the smaller ones would have. Why wouldn't they have? They have neurology department, they have CT scan 24-7. But a stroke unit is a logistical thing. Okay. Somebody needs to say, I am starting a stroke unit, gear up people together, make sure somebody is available 24-7, make sure the CT scan is functional. The Nair CT has not been working for six months. Clearly, you can't have a stroke unit if the CT is not working. KEM is now only one CT. So if you've got two patients lined up and you take an emergency, and the, these days patients and relatives have become very aggressive and they see somebody going in, they'll say, I'm to five se baitha hai, aap kaise isko le sakte ho. So unless you create a setup where everything can be done um, within that period, it's, it's totally logistics, it's management, it is not really about skill sets, I mean those are a given, but it is how from the time the patient comes to casualty, 
everybody involved is alerted everybody is told stroke has come ta 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 keep everything ready cut 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 patient goes and gets everything done it's a it's it's a management thing and to expect something like that in a bmc hospital would be impossible i mean i don't see how they could you're seeing something parish one ct scan is not your one ct scan is there yeah ct scan to bahut hai na sir quite a few ha ah, no neuro but that is that, that is, is not, not right. there is no in fact now that we're talking about this i'm just thinking in the public hospitals do they have any kind of system for anything at all you know i mean yes you're diseased you go there you get treated that's fine but acute stroke acute mi has to have a, a set up as well uh and remember acute mi acute stroke people have acute mi there are very few hospitals where they have an in-house cardiologist available instantaneously for a primary PCI. angioplasty everybody comes from their homes you call them you request them to in the morning they'll drive they'll come if they've had a little bit to drink at night in a party then that cardiologist is not available then you have to call three others some of them don't pick up their phones because they have a policy of not picking up phones at night it is a it is a mess I, again i think there also it's in house kokila ben reliance because they have full timers attached and you know systematic stuff it works south bombay all the other hospitals are all consultant and honorary based here so where you may not find somebody at 2 in the morning on a saturday or a sunday or things like that so you have to know that also that if you can't contact your cardiologist which hospital is equipped enough to manage your patient because they are equipped with reasonably trained doctors who can manage you know like hinduja also can manage an acute mi because they have in house full time people etc etc so you know you have to know those things as well and you must uh, also of course you already know this but acute myocardial infarction pami that is a primary uh, angioplasty for myocardial infarction is the standard of care you cannot think of thrombolysis now in the in, where pci is available so intervention is the treatment of care if the window period is respected uh, you must consider sending the patient directly to a place with a cath lab and a cardiologist in readiness okay ha uh, ji if the bp is very low they can they, do, they can do pami with the help of what is called as an aortic balloon uh, where they keep the bp up with the balloon and uh, they can do a pami yes they can do a pami if necessary yes you know all of these things actually become very tricky in the sense that i had one relative who developed severe headache in um, vapi 10 in the morning and they reached the hospital they got a ct done severe subarachnoid hemorrhage now what is to be done and so the question was do you rush the patient is unconscious but um is responding to stimuli is not dead and i guess would have recovered and you know things like that do you keep the patient in vapi where there is nobody who can manage an aneurysm rupture if we find that on a ct versus take the effort in 3 hours to drive in an ambulance break all signals and then come uh, to the hospital and for me the answer is very clear even if the person has to die on the way anyway if he was to die is going to die in vapi so the only answer here is you get into that bloody ambulance and come right now but what happens in practice is that the doctor there will say not fit it is not our responsibility you are going on your responsibility so the relative is saying are but he is saying that he can die i said yeah he can die but you know then there's a thought block and there's nobody else to counsel them and how it, it's very tricky I mean what the doctor there should have said is that listen yes there is a problem but you have no other alternative you have to be honest and say in my hospital to you will die if you're supposed to die 
the only chance you have is to go you know whether whichever hospital you have to go to that is what we need to learn to be able to do and facilitate instead of putting them in further confusion so i think this is the same thing with the acute mis and all that you know it has to be there are very few things in medicine that need this yeah it's acute abdomen acute stroke acute mi that's pretty much it you know so uh, just a brief here about because we said hemiplegia suddenly coming to you and you do this similarly subarachnoid hemorrhage this is something that can be diagnosed on a video call sometimes on a telephonic call sometimes you know what is a thunder clap headache worst ever headache of my life coming to a person who might be young also because very very aneurysms are the commonest cause of uh subarachnoid hemorrhage which are non traumatic traumatic of course is the commonest cause but non traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage very aneurysm rupture for example is the commonest cause this patient will come to you with a never before headache severe headache sometimes a seizure sometimes altered sensorium never hemiplegia never a focal deficit almost never a focal deficit so such a patient again you have to treat it like a stroke send them to a stroke unit a stroke unit will be required because they will do a ct angio they'll find the aneurysm they will probably put a coil inside the aneurysm immediately or whatever they do in in the current times so again a very very uh, time bound approach has to be followed even in subarachnoid so in fact yeah. now that we i'll just give turn this around with some perspective right Uh, let's say you discover a breast lump and um, you know patient comes to you and there's a breast lump and you'll say here you know let's get a mammogram done and mammography is done and a person says or my wife says you know that this seems to be a birats 5 definite cancer panic and in our country to biopsy will be done tomorrow histopath day after surgery done in 4 days as if it's an emergency it's the priorities right a no cancer except all is an emergency all person can die in 24 hours aml aml in in, in in an acute leukemia no other cancer patient needs this to become an emergency and as doctors also we need to put it into them saying relax we can take our time one week two weeks three weeks is not going to make a difference instead cancer becomes an emergency and strokes and mis and these thunder clap headaches become ha theek che headache che we'll see tomorrow by the time the patient is dead or something like that and i think we need to even talk to our patients and counsel them that a cancer is not an emergency a lump is never an emergency it's to be thought through the only true emergencies are the acute ones right it's trauma stroke mi acute abdomen that's it i mean um, acute chest pain pe etc but that's it na no? it's like five or six things that maybe most of us see once in a month or once in a week with friends and family that's the only time we need to act very fast and that's pretty much it yeah everything else is manageable so uh last 10 minutes i'll take up uh, with his uh, spouse's occupation <laughs> dr dr bijal is a uh, is a uh, specializes in mammography she's a breast radiologist she's a breast radiologist okay uh what over dinner conversations what have you learned from her that you can pass on to us <laughs> Oh god so she is uh, um an advocate for breast screening that is her passion and uh, she would tell you if she were here that every woman above the age of 45 should get an annual mammogram done up to the age of 75 if um, not annual then definitely not less than once in 2 years it has to be an x-ray mammogram not a sono mammogram sono mammograms are not screening tools they are diagnostic tools so i think that's the first and most important thing the second is that uh, breast cancer today and i think it's very interesting that for many people now with the advances that have occurred in surgery radiotherapy etc breast cancer has pretty much become like a disease like having chronic stable angina 
or you know something like that it is no longer truly a life threatening disease killers is when you have a 25 year old with metastatic breast cancer you know this patient is gone but when you have a 60 year old with a lump um, you know t1 n0 m0 you know that this is a completely curable malignancy and things like that so it's also about making sure that people realize that there are so many options and good options now let's say unlike with prostate cancer where there are no good options right every surgery can lead leave, leave, leave you with some complication or the other that can have a life uh, changing outcome but with breast none of that really happens so she is also a very big advocate about talking to patients you know that talking to patients question she does that all the time making them understand what their options are and also making bridges with the surgeons the physicians see a lot of our onco surgeons oncologists don't have the time to talk to patients you know and when you establish a rapport with your screening patients they're coming to you every year two years for the last 20 years you develop a relationship and when you find something you're able to talk to them and make that out Uh, breast mr has become a big tool whenever we see lesions in the breast um, that are often multifocal or prior to conservative surgery to make sure there is no other disease than breast mrs get done and though she is not an mri person she the only mri she reads is breast mr which she is trained for um and so that is one focus thing she does and then a lot of biopsies and stuff like that because you need to be able to do that to diagnose cancers can uh, breast mr replace uh, x ray mr no, no 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 as a screening no, tool no 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 that to breast mr is not a screening tool it is only used for screening in patients who are braca1 braca2 positive um, Uh, and require uh, screening Frequent. for multifocal disease but otherwise all screening is x-ray screening uh, mammography screening when you said sonom uh, sonomammography is a diagnostic tool what is it used for so when you find something in the breast a okay. uh, lesion then you use ultrasound to see that lesion and figure out if co- the combination of x-ray and ultrasound can give you a better understanding of what it might be because your main role when you are imaging the breast and you find something is to try and filter out the benign lesions right which means nothing further needs to be done so they have this birads classification of uh, 1 2 3 4 0 1 2 3 4 5 where 5 means it's definite cancer of course has to be proven on histopath one and two means they are benign nothing further needs to be done three is indeterminate so usually six months follow up and four is likely to be cancer so a biopsy is required but it may still turn out not to be cancer so their whole aim is to classify into one of these uh, criteria and if it's one or two then you tell the patient that listen you may feel a lump you may have something but not to worry it's perfectly all right there's nothing to be done it's all good if it's three then women get very worried because we may have cancer why are we being made to wait for 6 uh, months but you're being made to wait for 6 months because the chance of malignancy is less than 5 to 10% so somebody has to counsel the patient to say listen because your chance of malignancy is low and biopsies are not without complications biopsies may not sample necessarily the right area and if the chance that on follow up the lesion will regress is high then you don't need to go ahead and do something drastic with 4 and 5 you have to actually tell the patient that look don't wait for more than a week or two don't not do anything you know and and get something done uh, i know that there are uh, uh, ayurvedan homeopath physicians in the audience as well and i think everybody does their job the way they are supposed to do but let's be clear with things like breast cancer breast lumps the first modality of choice has to be the 
current protocols developed with modern medicine. It can't be that you have a mass which is Bhairats 5 and then they go to somebody who says, I am an Ayurvedic oncosurgeon and I will treat your uh, lump with a leaf that I will put on the breast and the lump will get, uh, you know, will dissolve or will come into the leaf in about three months or six months and all of that stuff that happens. So, in fact, um, radiologists like Bijal, and she's not the only one in this area, there's Yojana Nalaude, there's um, uh, Gita Shah in, in Andheri. They talk to the patients and they also counsel them that, listen, you need a biopsy. If the biopsy is positive, then you will have to see an oncosurgeon. They don't give names, but they will say that this is the path that you would have to follow and then take it from there. So all of these things are often done by the radiologist because there's nobody else to do any of this. Can I ask you a question on prostate? Am yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so often, apart from brain, I can you can okay. <laughs> okay, we uh, we often get patients who routinely screen for PSA. Do you think PSA screening is now scientifically advisable? We are not sure. <laughs> All right. So I can tell you what I'm definitely sure of. Above the age of 70, no PSA to be done ever. End of story. Mm -hmm. It's completely useless. Of no point. It may come high because uh, above the age of 70, about 30% of people will have some prostate cancer foci, which can raise the PSA a little bit. But those prostate cancer foci are unlikely to be the cause of you getting symptomatic or dying, or dying. of prostate cancer. As you grow older, uh, even more so. So at the age of 80, 85, if you're going to do a PSA to diagnose uh, possibility of prostate cancer, at 80, 85, 50% of people will have on biopsy some prostate cancer foci and nothing further needs to be done. So your only challenge is people between the ages of 50 and 69. Should we do a serum uh, PSA uh, to diagnose uh, uh, possible prostate cancer? The Earlier guidelines from the American and the European societies were very, very strong. Yes, you must because you pick up prostate cancer and you can treat it and uh, you save lives. But people have now found that it doesn't seem to change the trajectory of most prostate cancers if they are screen detected. So what it means is that if you are symptomatic and a prostate cancer is found, that's a different thing. You treat it, it's a disease, etc. But when you pick up a prostate cancer in an asymptomatic individual with screening, doing PSA, there are two things. A, the treatment doesn't change the eventual prognosis. And B, the surgical options, none of them are particularly good. That, you know, a patient often will turn around and tell you, Nahi kiya hota, serum PSA to bahut achha tha. now we found something on prostate, now we have to do a biopsy, an, an MR prostate, then we have to do a biopsy, then you do a PET CT, PSMA PET is a specific PET CT we do. And now they are telling me to choose between cryo, brachytherapy, surgery, robotic, etc. I don't know what to choose and I don't know what I should do and you know all of that. But let's come back to the first one and this is a very interesting study because very few randomized controlled trials exist for treatment in prostate cancer and the NHS was able to do this 15 years ago. I don't think they would be able to do it today. They took screen detected um, uh, prostate cancers, which means completely asymptomatic individuals, about 1500 of them, where the prostate cancer was only picked up because they went for a screening test and the PSA was positive. All right, that's the baseline. 500 were told do nothing, except we will follow you up. 500 were given surgery, 500 were given radiotherapy. Followed up for 15 years. End of 15 years, eventual outcome, same. 
which means if you took those 500 people where nothing was nothing meaning active surveillance you follow up if they grow you treat if they don't grow you continue to do active surveillance and they found that that strategy worked equally well which means that if you find a prostate cancer in a 60 year old only because you went and did a platinum health checkup and a serum PSA was done which was high and you tell the patient don't do anything we'll repeat the MRI after one year if it remains the same we'll repeat the MRI after one more year and until it grows or you become symptomatic nothing is to be done then the reverse question is why do the PSA in the first place if in any case the best thing to do for a patient is to do nothing to begin with you know so it is it is an interesting conundrum I haven't done my PSA I'm 58 I'm not gonna do one I do a lot of testing I do my lipids every three months uh, uh, etc but I will not do a single cancer screening test for myself ever because if I'm asymptomatic no screen detected cancer is worth treating uh, at this point in time if I was a smoker then an LDCT would work in women it's different you do HPV DNA for CA cervix it's a must every five years till 65 and a mammography these are the only two things that are required and I'll tell you how things go rubbish right last week a GP called up saying that um, and this was somebody who had come from the US and did this platinum health checkup with CEA levels and CA 99 and all that crap and one of them was borderline high borderline high means abhi pet CT karenge to find out why it is borderline high Aray, but why do the tumor markers in the first place unless you have a family history of CA ovary or you have a family history of malignancy or some high risk factor doing a test to try and find out cancer in the hope that by removing it early you will make a difference doesn't make any sense at all because it doesn't change what would have happened in the future if you had the cancer and it presented when you were symptomatic so it's a lot to think about and sometimes the simplest thing is to just go with the flow and just do what everybody is doing but do understand that cancer screening is a completely different ball game and the only proven data that we currently have is for breast cancer lung cancer in smokers HPV DNA in CA cervix in non high risk people and serum PSA to half an extent that's it colonoscopy um, and colonoscopy for colorectal cancer that's it nothing else so that's that uh, if the PSA is high and the patient now says my PSA is 40, the next step sometimes is to go to a urologist who will do a prostate biopsy. No, no, no. they don't do it. No, the first so thing MRI is a prostate is MR. So MR has to be the first thing. Yeah, yeah, Even yeah. if they feel a hard prostate yeah, on yeah, PR, yeah, 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 yeah. then MR still remains. Yeah, there. so now it's become standard MR prostate and then based on the findings you do a transrectal because what also happens is that while they do a 12 quadrant if the MR has identified an area that is abnormal then you will focus on that more so that you don't miss any cancer at all and then you do a trust guided biopsy and then if it's 40 you will also do a PSMA PET to see if there is any spread anywhere else so up to anything above 15 you would do a PSMA PET for sure less than 15 it's a clinical judgment call PSMA PET just to orient you is a PET scan where FDG is not used uh, what is used prostate specific membrane the same PSA ka, the PSMA is the receptor uh, in the uh, cancer and uh, this particular um, radioactive. Uh, radioactive dye will bind to that and show it up so all prostate cancer PET CTs are called PSMA PET CTs and PSMA you have to PET ask CT. for yeah. it okay I think we, we'll uh, end the formal talk here any questions please come here and uh, please ask if you can come here it will be better for our shoot
I'm able to get all the information on that. So that will not include any dye in that? Of it course is, it is. It's it a, will. It's CTA a dye injection. Yeah, yeah, perfusion yeah. It's a perfusion angiography. So it yeah, will yeah. be done. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah. I think uh, we'll take a break here. Bill, uh, before sir goes, uh, a small token from all of us. He's, a, uh, he's an avid reader, so some books for him. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, quite a good number. And uh, hopefully see you next month here. You know, I always like to have the last word. Yeah, of course. I did not know what to expect. Um, uh, I don't know how you all know the efforts that Tushar puts in. He came to meet me uh, and I live in King Circle. So for me, it was best that he comes there. So we had coffee at the Starbucks at Khalsa College. We spent an hour, hour and a half. He told me everything that he does. But I still didn't understand how exactly this works and I am um, so impressed. I mean, this is such an amazing thing, Tushar. Uh, uh, my God, yeah. hats and, uh, off to you I'm, and congrats I, I and can, everything. I will have to thank him that he, dis he agreed to do it without PPT. We are doing an imaging talk without images and uh, yeah, but you could see how useful it is for all of us. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.